Hello, everybody, and welcome to season four of Mission Control, a podcast focusing on executive directors and nonprofit leaders and how they strive to make positive impacts in their community. I'm your host, Paul Schmidt, owner and creative video strategist for Introduce Multimedia, and I would love to welcome a really good friend of mine to the show, Jen Doobie from the, let's see if I can get it, the Area Agencies on Aging Association of Michigan. Very good. I... That is not easy to remember. <laughs> when we, when we um, go by 4 a.m., it's a little easier because there's four A's and an M, but you did great. No, it is. We we abbreviate it here because we're into acronyms and abbreviation in our office. We abbreviate it 4 AMI. So Yes, perfect. So yeah, absolutely. And so, well, let's just uh, take it almost from the beginning, Jen. You and I have known each other for the better part of a decade. Can you believe that? Um, it's been about 10 years or so, maybe just a little bit more. I, I think it's been about 14, actually. Oh, geez. Oh. Because wow. it was, okay. it was, it was two positions ago for me. And I've been in those two positions over 10 years. So yeah, I got to think it's been more like 14. We've, we've, we've known each other a while, friend. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, I mean, it's interesting how we met. I, mm -hmm. I, I love this story. Um, uh, the fact that we met through a project of like a mutual friend of ours or a mutual person that we both knew and they asked me to uh document a journey that you that you played a part of what 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 do you remember about that that uh everything that i i actually remember the day we met um <laughs> yeah so our mutual friend was going on a health and wellness journey and at the time I was doing personal training and nutritional consulting, and she had hired me to help her get her health back on track. She had a plethora of issues and one of them was weight loss. But as a female, I kind of specialized in helping women um, through that difficult hormonal age get back on track. And so she hired you to video uh, some of our sessions and kind of work through the strategy that we use to get her where she needed to be. And so I remember the day you walked in the studio with your cameras in hand and and I was a little nervous at the time. So I'm like, he's going to record everything I say and do. <laughs> I better make sure I know what I'm doing, right? Yeah. No, I thought it was I thought it was great because we did it in a style that a lot of folks uh, kind of like would recognize, uh, you know, a little bit of a uh, reality TV style where we did like yes. little little asides and stuff like that. But you were fabulous. I thought that, you you know. You may may have said you were nervous, but you are really a natural on camera, and so it was really really uh, awesome to 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 go through that journey with her and and you. Um, what was the biggest thing that you felt you took away from that? Well, honestly, as we were talking about it, I was thinking that I I actually believe that that was probably the first time I really thought about my next transition, which was going into corporate wellness and owning my own business, because I saw the potential of really looking at someone's journey through through this you, you, new path, you know, this kind of taking them from A to Z, um, looking at a multiple factor program. And it was fun. I mean, it was really fun. And of course there was great success in her program, which was awesome because that made it work for all of us. She got what she needed. It was great for me. It was great for you. And I loved that whole idea of collaboration. I'm not sure before that I had really worked on a project that collaborated with so many people who had similar goals and desired outcomes, but coming at it from different, um, purposes, right? I mean, we all were in it for kind of a slightly different reason. Yeah. And, you know, I think that what I took away from that was like, you know, it was just a really, well, it's just what we do. It's just like really capturing this story. And, you know, we were able to 
travel in different ways, but also having this plan because this was a linear aspect. Uh, this story was just like a linear aspect of uh, this person's journey from start to completion, from start of training for this, uh, uh, what was it, a triathlon or a... Yeah, it was it, it was, was an event, but I don't think it was yeah. a triathlon. I can't remember exactly, but she did have an end goal. Yeah, yeah, and then making it through to that triathlon, and uh, you know, and actually finishing it. I believe she finished it, but uh, that was it's too too far in the past for me to remember exact details like that. I'm, but it was uh, knowing her and still being very good friends with her. I'm sure she finished it. <laughs> I don't think she ever, <laughs> you know, didn't finish anything. <laughs> well, well, you know, and that's that's what's funny because you did a little bit of a segue into something else I wanted to talk about because you evolved your mission <laughs> from what you were doing into, like you mentioned, corporate wellness, because we didn't really talk about what exactly your role was in this in this video series. What what were you what were you asked to do? So I, I, I mean, as what I recall is I was just guiding her, teaching, training um, to help her achieve her goals. So I was her personal trainer, her, her nutritional coach. And, you know, I always thought of myself in that role as kind of a therapist, too, because especially for women, it can be a very difficult and emotional journey to get from point A to point B or A to Z, however far they're going. And uh, they need a lot of support. And I think my role was one of being a support person for her and a cheerleader. I'm, I was, I've, I'm always a cheerleader. It doesn't matter what job I'm in. I feel like I'm always trying to cheer someone on. My, you know, I've, I've had a lot of different roles throughout my life, but I would say there's one very consistent piece and that I'm always trying to build people up to make them better. Um, in every role I've ever been in, that's kind of my, well, I think that's just a God-given strength is that I like to, I like to encourage people. I like to help people be successful on their journey. And so it seems like every role I've been placed in, there's an emphasis on that. And I believe I, it started with this project that we did together. Yeah. And so let's talk a little bit about, you know, using, using that aspect and developing your own business. Mm -hmm. Um, talk a little bit about, that journey in which you you just kind of like uh, took that took that road into that whole new unknown. Yeah, well, I I believe I'm an entrepreneur at heart, and I love new things. I am not a person. My husband will tell you this. I don't like to stay in one place very long because I always like to challenge myself, learn, grow, try new things. I just believe that. Um, that's, you know, what is, it's a cliche, but you know, never, no one ever grows unless they step outside their comfort zone. Right. And so I've always believed in that. And I've always encouraged myself to look at things that maybe look like hurdles or something that you have to really gain a new skill set for, or challenge yourself, be outside that comfort zone and go for it. So, you know, my, my, my first degree was actually as a, uh, personal training assistant. And um, I worked at Sparrow and I did everything from orthopedic rehab to, you know, um, I think my last position I worked in at Sparrow was uh, pediatric rehab. And I loved that, but I, I didn't love the bureaucracy of a hospital, I guess. I've always felt very entrepreneurial and I didn't want to feel limited. And so um, I started doing more personal training. Uh, I was certified in nutrition and I, so I started kind of that path. And then from there, pivoting between this project with our mutual friend and having uh, one of my longtime clients say, will you come and work with my employees? I really like what you've done for my wife and I for our health. We'd like to, to bring that into our small business. And so it kind of, Paul, wasn't something I actually saw myself doing, but there was just that opportunity where someone presented me with, you know, this opportunity to try something new. And I remember thinking at first, boy, I don't really know much about working in the corporate realm, but I'm, I'm a smart woman. I can figure it out. And so I told him I would start And his company was about 30 people. So it was small. And, uh, I got together with a few of his key leaders, um, 
and I believe maybe his HR person, I'm trying to remember, I know I engaged with her later, but I don't know if it was, if she was involved in the initial conversation, but we just started talking about what is, what is your staff need? Like, how can I help corporately? I'm very used to one-on-ones and small groups, but this is kind of a different mentality. And I know that there's, you know, in order to prove there's going to have to be ROI, there's going to have to be, you know, strategy, and we're going to have to meet goals, and there's going to be a formal contract. And, you know, all of these things that I was somewhat unfamiliar with. But, um, you know, I got through the process with the first company. And it was a blast. I mean, I absolutely loved it. And I did a lot of public speaking. That was a huge part of what I did. I did a lot of goal setting. And then I realized if I wanted to expand this business, I needed to build it. I mean, it, it's not going to build itself. I actually need to build it. So I employed a lady named Angela um, and she helped me build a website slash um, health portal. And I, I developed all of my own content. Um, I had very, very, and I still have very strong beliefs about health and nutrition. So I didn't want to just take something that was pre-made. I wanted to I wanted to brand it. I wanted to brand it as everyone back then called me Trainer Jen. And I wanted to brand it Trainer Jen style. And so I did. And, you know, part of those, um, part of that growth was um, I published a cookbook for what I believe to be true about nutrition and how I wanted to see people eating. I built all these health campaigns and was able to sell them to companies. And then I had a, you know, data capture uh website that recorded employee engagement and rewards and incentives by points and all sorts of different things. But this is a realm I was very unfamiliar with. But here's the thing. I think when you want to launch in business, one of the things you have to tell yourself is you don't have to go in with every every, um, talent or skill that's required you can learn some of those things as you go along. I mean, you obviously have to have a foundation, common sense. I mean, there are things that you shouldn't launch a business unless you're willing to, you know, make a financial investment. There's all these pieces. But I went into some of it not knowing how to build some of it out. But I think the other thing is a true leader to me just hires really smart people. You just surround yourself with people who know what they're doing. And I think that was, you know, I entered into contract with you at the time and you did all of my videos and, you know, helped me on that journey. And you were a big part of that. But I had other consultants that I hired and brought alongside to help me in the areas that I didn't feel strong in. And I I don't think we should ever feel like we can't do something because we don't have all the answers up front. I'm just not a believer in that at all. I think that's, it's a, it's the chicken way to do it. You know, you go in and say, okay, I don't have all the skills, but I can surround myself with people smarter than me if I need to. And I can build whatever is necessary to make this work. That's what I did. No. And it was, it was a a good run with it too. I mean, I was real impressed just seeing what you were doing, how you were going about it. And, you know, what did you feel like was the biggest struggle? Um, I think, well, there's a couple of things, but the first one that came to mind when you said that was knowing, learning, understanding how to grow a business. And when I say that it was, the foundation was there, but there were aspects of growth that confused me and challenged me. One of them was I needed more help, but didn't really have enough contracts to hire employees. And do you bring on people hoping that, you know, it was the financial component, I guess, of building the business was probably always the most challenging. And, you know, at at the max, I held about, you know, five or six contracts, which I had two part time employees and myself. Um, there came a point in time where I either had to make a huge financial investment to really take it to the next level, or I needed to make a different decision and and maybe decide to step away from the business. And obviously that's not what I'm doing now. So I, I made the decision to, you know, step out of the business and, you know, sometimes I look back and I want to just myself for not sticking with it, you know, (laughs) give myself a little slap on the left and on the right. But it was a season and I learned a lot. And I think that's okay too. The run was a little over five years and I loved it. But as anyone, you know this because you own a business, it's also exhausting because it's 24 seven and you are just solely responsible for 
every component of your business and you're responsible for the employees and you're responsible for the pipeline and you're responsible for, you know, all of the operations. And there's just a lot that goes into it. And so there came a point in time when I would, I probably would have stayed, but someone presented me with another great idea um, that I really was very interested in. And I decided to take it and it ended up, I ended up finishing that last year um, and fulfilling all of my contracts, but then stepping into a different role with a little more security, I guess. A little more, more security, but you're also stepping into the nonprofit world in a way f slightly from your uh, entrepreneurial aspect. So let's talk about that transition from self-employed, entrepreneurial into uh, a nonprofit structured environment, which is if we go back to what you just said not too long ago about, you know, bureaucracy, this and that, not that maybe this new place had a lot of it, but still there's going to be processes and, and situations in there. So, so talk about, uh, talk about that, that transition to that and how, yeah. how you, how you embraced it. So I had met with the CEO a few times and originally, actually, the first time she approached me was at a networking event and she's like, I need someone just like you. And here's what I need this person to do. And I, I couldn't argue that I had the perfect skill set for the job. Um, but at the time, I wasn't quite ready to let go of Evolve. Um, and then her and I had met a couple more times and my husband and I talked about it. And the reason why I was able to transition is because there was a lot of autonomy in this position. So in this position, um, I was over five different departments, one of which was fitness related. Um, and it gave me the opportunity to grow and expand programs to develop. Um, I was I was hired in as a director level and there was a lot of freedom. I, I didn't really feel like I had such a pigeonholed or boxed in way to the way I ran my five departments. I had some flexibility there. I mean, there's always some boundaries, but they aren't boundaries that I really had any desire to go outside of. But in terms of program development, content development, um, you know, staffing events, like there was a lot of freedom to take the department and run it the way you see fit. And so I think that that was probably what made it easier to transition because in all reality, I, I felt somewhat entrepreneurial in the role and um, I knew taking the role that it was not going to be a long time fit. Like I knew it wasn't going to be my forever job. Um, I knew that when I went in, um, but um, it was a good transition at the time. And I think the other thing I look for, Paul, I don't want to come across as wishy-washy because I think everything I do is strategic but it was an opportunity to build another skill set that I hadn't had before. So now I was part of an executive team. Um, I was working for a membership based organization, which I had not really done before. Um, there were a lot of things within this company that I had a chance to take a skill set that was um, maybe not very polished and polish it very well. And yeah, I think, yeah, I'll just say that. I was going to add another component, but I don't think it's necessary. I, I think it was I think it was a good transition for the time. And quite honestly, there are days I still really miss that role um, because it was a very fun job. Um, and I did learn a lot and I absolutely adored the people I worked with. But the time came for another change. <laughs> well, before we go on to that next change, because it seems like I said, uh, you're you're path has been very linear um it's just been, really i don't I, feel know, like it's linear at all fact, but if, you, okay. if you lay it out if you lay it out it's like i did this and I let me do this i did this it let, allowed me to do this and now you mentioned that you were able to work within a team to to develop a new skill set what was that skill set that you were looking or looking or maybe that you did develop well, 
I think, I think learning how to function in a larger organization, because the reality was all of my work prior, I had either been somewhat independent or very small business. And this was, you know, a larger staff of people at this particular job. I managed at any given time, 40 employees. Um, and a lot of, some of them were seasonal because one of the things I did, it was uh, some summer programming. And so I only had those employees during the summer, um, but managing employees and, you know, that was, that was kind of a new thing for me and a skill set that maybe was a little bit weaker because I'd not had that experience before always working independent or for myself prior, um, except for my time at Sparrow, you know, was, it was a little bit different, but here again, I was in a director level. So I was, I was management with employees to, uh, answer to and take care of. And that was a little bit different skill set. I think the other thing was, although I was used to juggling multiple companies when I had evolve and each company looked a little different and functioned a little different, I had five different departments that required different things of me. And so I, I had to become really good, I guess, at transitioning and having a lot of balls in the air at one time and um, running departments with different goals and functions, um, even some of them different seasons, different staffing, different, you know, different requirements. And that was that was that was quite the juggling act. You know, but, but it was fun. I, I, I think the reason I was so content in that job for as long as I was, is because I never had the same day twice. And I think that that's a motto I would die by is don't, don't, I could never personally settle for a job that was so repetitive that you didn't have an opportunity to grow and expand your knowledge. That's just super important to me as a human, even outside of work. I'm always, you know, what else can I learn? And last year I took up sewing and I'm like, why am I interested in sewing? Well, I don't know. Cause I just don't know how to do it. So why not learn how to, you know, you know, pick up a skill that a lot of people can't do. Why not? Just, I just like to challenge myself. That, that's amazing. Did you really, did you really pick up sewing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I went and bought a sewing machine and said, I can go on YouTube and learn anything I need to learn. And, um, yeah. you know, I, I just think, I don't know, it's funny because it's like when I hit 50, did I decide I needed like, <laughs> like older lady skills? I don't know. I don't know why sewing came to mind other than it's a skill that not many people have. I took up gardening a couple years ago and we live in the city. This, so this is not an easy task, but we, you know, we decided even in our small city lot, we were going to build a raised bed and I was going to learn to garden. And I, you know, had to learn about soil and seeds and I, I grow them from seeds. I'm going to start them next week in my basement with my indoor grow lights in the winter months and knowing when to transition them and how to take care of them. And, you know, it's like gardening's a cool thing, you know, watching something. Well, I, I just, I, this is totally unrelated, but I have to tell the story because I get <laughs> really passionate rail. about Off every, <laughs> I, I just get passionate about everything I do. And so I had some uh, girlfriends over, I think it was for a book club. I don't remember, but my seedlings had come up, they had sprouted and, you know, they were probably like a half inch big in the pot. And I had, you know, tomatoes and cucumbers and zucchini and some basil and parsley, just different things. And I had brought them up. It was like starting to become spring, more daylight. I can't remember. It was probably maybe early April. And I had them in my window box when everyone came over. And they're like, oh, that's so cool that you're gardening. And, you know, and so we were like overlooking at them. And I said, and I actually got really emotional. I said, it's just really cool when you can take a seed and you can bury it in the dirt and all the steps that you take cause that seed to grow. Like that's the epitome of life. Like everything might start it, start in the dark, you know, it's buried, but you have to nurture it and take care of it to bring it up so that it comes up out of the dirt into the light. It grows, it flourishes and it produces. And it just, as I was thinking about it, I'm like, I feel like that's my whole life. You know, like that's ultimately what we want to do. We take something that's hidden in the dark that wouldn't even know exists in us and we nurture it and we grow it. And eventually we see it sprout and we see it grow and we see it produce. And we're like, wow, that's really cool. So gardening to me was like a whole life lesson about some very important things in life. Wow. That I didn't expect to, I didn't, I didn't expect to, to, to talk about. That's great. That's actually really, really cool. And then um, it actually goes into, you know, where you're at right now. In fact, the whole, the whole uh, 
nonprofit work that you're doing currently for 4AM or 4AMI, however we want to call it. Um, but first of all, I forgot to do this at the front end. This is what happens when it's the first episode of the new season. What is the mission of uh, Area Agencies on Aging? So the Area Agencies on Aging have a mission of providing dignity and independence to older adults who want to stay in their homes. So what we essentially do is provide in-home services and supports for the uh, persons over 65, those with disabilities who just don't want to leave their comfortable environment. They don't want to go into nursing home or institutional settings. Um, and so we work really hard um, legislatively and fiscally to provide what they need to keep them in their in their homes, or at least so they have a choice. We say so people can age in the place of their choice. Some people may, may choose a nursing home. Um, it might be the best alternative for them. But if they don't want that, we don't want them to have to do that. And so what is your role? What do you do? So my role, yeah, when you started and said executive directors, I'm like, oh, we make, better make sure we talk about my role because I am not the executive director of 4AM. Um, no. uh, but I am the, I was hired to be the operations manager for 4AM. And we are a entity that was, well, the, let me start with the AAAs. So we have 16 AAAs in the state that cover all 83 counties in Michigan. And they actually were a federal mandate through the Older Americans Act to provide this service. And so um, in 1974, when the AAAs were mandated, um, Michigan was actually one of the first states to create an association. Every state is required because it's a federal um, requirement it, to have area agencies on aging, but not every state has an association. Michigan was actually one of the first states to launch an association. We might have been the very first. I should clarify that, but I'm pretty sure we were, you know, we were at the forefront of that saying we might have 16 different agencies, but there are some things we want to do collaboratively with a statewide effort. Um, and so the association was started 1974, 1975, to be the statewide voice for the 16 AAAs in the state. So that's how the actual association came to be. That's awesome. Well, I mean, and how do you feel that all the things that you brought forward over the last 10, 15 years has really helped you in this role now? Well, you know, you know me personally, Paul, and you know that my faith is very, very strong. And I do believe that everything I've done before kind of led me to this position. Um, to me, it was a huge blessing and it hit actually at the most perfect time. And I won't get into those details here, mm -hmm. but the timing of it was unbelievable and it was not at all what I was looking for. Um, there were some things happening in my current job that I knew I need, needed to transition. And it not that it felt urgent, but I just kind of knew like, okay, my time is up. And I really was at a loss for where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do specifically. And, you know, you go on indeed and you start looking like every other time in my life, I'll say this, I always went to something, right? So it was always because there was something in front of me and someone dangled a carrot and said, hey, I have this opportunity. Well, this was the first time in my professional career that that wasn't the case. Somebody wasn't dangling the carrot saying, hey, I have a role for you. Why don't you come here? And so it was a little bit more open ended. And so I had had some interviews and I had some jobs that I actually thought were really good fits and I wasn't selected. And of course, my position was always, well, must not be where God wants me to be because I didn't get the job and that's okay. I'm just going to keep pressing on and looking. And then when this job came along, when I read the job description, I'm like, well, I mean, I can do the job, but I never saw myself working with older adults. I never saw myself, you know, in doing certain tasks that were part of this role, but I went through the interview process and, you know, I, I, the interview went very well. And I think I got a call like the next day and, you know, they offered me the job and we, you know, we did a little negotiating and then I accepted the position and I'm going to be honest because someone might need to hear this. The first couple of weeks I was in the job, I was like, I made a mistake. What did I do? I was, I did not think that it was going to be a good fit. It was really, really hard. Actually, it was probably the first month. 
However, I think it's because it was very, very different than anything I had done before. And I just had to, you know, put on my big girl pants and say, well, you're here now. Let's see what you can do with what you got. And the reality is I look back now and it was probably one of the best decisions I ever made. Like I, I feel like it is exactly where I'm supposed to be. So that's great. But I don't think we always get that, you know, little honeymoon feeling when we start a new position. Sometimes maybe it's, it doesn't feel good in the beginning, but I was really uncomfortable more than I had ever been because there were a lot of things that I was unfamiliar with. So for example, I was very, I was an expert in my field in fitness, nutrition, education. There were certain things that there's, I just would say I could go toe to toe with a lot of people in the state and be just as qualified. This in particular, I didn't know much about aging services. I didn't know much about care management. I didn't know much about, um, you know, advocacy and, and the legislative process in terms of how we advocate for money for the budget, all of this stuff. And so there was so much new stuff. I thought, oh my gosh, what have I done? <laughs> but like I've done with everything else, I just had to say there is going to be a learning curve and you are a capable person. So just do it. And I did. And I had a lot of support. I have an amazing board of directors um, who I think have been really instrumental in helping me. And I know some people aren't as blessed with a good board of directors, but I feel like they've all been very supportive and very helpful. And I have my executive director, my boss. There's just the two of us at the association. So we pretty much handle everything. There's, you know, we don't have a large staff. Um, and he's great too. He's he's been great since day one. Um, but I always think when you're in a position like mine, there, you know, the board members can make a difference and and we have a great board. So um, you know, as time has went on, I've learned a whole nother skill set. Um, I actually love the advocacy and the legislative piece of what we do. I'm not going to say I'm super smart about it, but I learn every day. But the other thing that's great about this job, Paul, is sometimes when you go into a position, I guess it depends on who you work for. I was fortunate that I felt like I got to come in as the entrepreneurial spirit and say, there are some things I want to do. And I have presented a lot of things to give myself freedom, flexibility as an entrepreneur would. And luckily, because I think my board appreciates me and my boss appreciates me, I really haven't been told no a lot. I've been able to expand my role. I've been able to learn and grow in different areas and kind of create a position that focuses on my strengths. And um, and then those areas where I want to learn, I've been given permission to kind of, you know, access those areas and learn and grow. And so it's been really rewarding. And um, yeah, I just, I guess all I can say is I feel really blessed and content with where I'm at right now. So we'll see what the future holds, but the unexpected ended up being really awesome. <laughs> that's a great story. And that's a good place to end. Thank you very much for your time, Jen. Really appreciate you coming onto the show. Well, thank um, you for having me, friend. I appreciate it very much. And if anybody wanted to uh, reach out to you about anything that you said or anything about uh, 4 a.m., where where is the best place that people can reach you? Well, I would start by just checking out our website at www. and it's the number four four ami. org. Um, my contact information is on there. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn if you have a question. That would probably be another way to get a hold of me. But if anyone has someone, if they're listening and they're looking to get services and they're curious about what AAA's offer. The website will do that. And then the AAA is by county. So you can look at your county and connect with your local AAA to find out exactly what's available in your service area. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Jen. We really appreciate you being on the show. Thanks. Paul. Okay. And thank you all again for taking some time to listen to our program. And don't miss the next episode coming out in a couple weeks. And if there is someone that you know of that you would like to hear about their journey, please email us at missioncontrol at unaduce.com. And if this is your first time here, please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcasting platform and give us a positive review. Thank you all again, and we'll see you next time in the Control Center.